Um, okay. What I'm going to talk about today is practical stuff. Um, you know, Claude gave you a, a lecture yesterday or the day before um, talking about the, the, um, the mathematics of tires and whatever. What I'm going to talk to you about today is making your tires work, making your tires happy. The only connection that you've got between your Formula student car and the ground is the four little black patches of rubber that sit down there. And it is hugely important that those patches be kept very happy. Okay, we'll start at the beginning. The first thing is the choice of tire for your car is probably the most important technical choice you're going to have to make about the whole car. Technical choice, I said. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a, an electric car or an or a autonomous car or an ICE car. Um, the only connection, as I said, the only way you can react the forces through the ground and make your car accelerate in either lateral or longitudinal directions is through the force that you generate at the ground. Now, everyone wants to tell you that the way you choose the best tire is to use the data from the tire testing consortium. And I'm gonna tell you, nah, don't do that. Um, let other people do that. <laughs> Essentially, choose the best tire as viewed by what the opposition are running that you can get hold of, that you can buy. Um, okay, uh, moving along. A problem with the tire testing data is that it doesn't take into account the human factor. A tire that gives you the most grip is not necessarily the tire that you want to have. Generally, tires that have a very high coefficient of grip also have a very narrow band of operation. And so they're extremely difficult to drive on for average drivers, amateur drivers. You know, we're not all like Lewis Hamilton or, or whatever and can make those narrow band and Pirelli Formula One tires work. So, a tire that scores well in grip and side load and so forth on, uh, on the tire testing machine isn't necessarily the tire that you want on the track. And I'll go into that a little further. Okay, the second choice is what size wheel and tire do you use? Now there's been a move over recent years for teams to use 10 inch tires rather than the previously very popular 13 inch tires. Why? Well, because people start talking about a lighter weight and lower rotational inertia and all sorts of other highfalutin things. But the real truth is, if you're choosing a tire for a race car, is that the basis upon which you would make your choice? To me, there is only one parameter that is of vital importance in choosing the right tire for your Formula student car. Does anybody want to tell me what that is? The fastest one. Okay. And whether it's a 10 inch tire or a 13 inch tire and whether it's made in China or whether it's made in the US or whether it's made in Russia really doesn't matter. You want the fastest tire that you can buy. And that's not necessarily a 10 inch tire. The other benefit of a 13 inch wheel and tire is it gives you um, more space inside the wheel to have a decent brake package. Um, it gives you more space inside the wheel to form a solid basis to react the suspension and steering lateral loads into the chassis the farther apart you can you can put those wishbones or, or suspension arms, the, the lighter the load that you have to feed into the chassis. 
A 10 inch wheel, on the other hand, uh, restricts the size of brake that you can have uh, and also makes the loading into the chassis uh, much higher. Uh, you know, especially if you're using a virtual swing axle length that is shorter than infinity. It means that the suspension pickup points of the chassis are going to be closer together than the suspension pickup points out at the upright, front and back. And if you're trapped having to fit inside a 10 inch wheel at the outside, it means that you're going to have those suspension points much closer together once you get into the chassis. And this makes it very, very difficult to have a, a good load path. If you're using a, a space frame chassis, it makes it difficult to feed the forces into or very close to a node. So weighing them up, my recommendation, unless you really know what you're doing, my recommendation would always be to use a 13 inch wheel. And there's a secret of why I say use a 13 inch wheel, because I'll tell you, the fastest formula student tire out there in the big bad world is a 13 inch tire from Goodyear. It's not a Hoosier, it's not a Continental, it's not an Avon, it's a 13 inch tire from Hoosier, okay? That may be difficult to, uh, for you to source or make, but in the notes that I've sent to Andre, I have given him a, an email address for a contact uh, for, for you to be able to, uh, to contact Goodyear if you want to investigate that particular tire. Okay. Uh, I just made a point for myself saying, you know, it's an indisputable fact that regardless of what tire you have, the indisputable fact is that you must keep that tire happy at the, um, at the contact patch. Do not excite the rubber at the contact patch. Now, you, you actually know this because you know from experience. Oh. Um, obviously, when we start talking about that, I've got a message here saying my internet connection is unstable, so all's well. Um, having said that, obviously to talk about tires, uh, sorry, springs and shock absorbers dampers is very important, and I'll do that in a while, but we'll skip over that right at the moment. Okay, the first thing that you've got to ensure is any vibration caused by the rotation of the wheels and tires is going to make the tire contact patch unhappy. So it is very important to balance the wheels. It's very important that the, uh, that the wheel and tire runs true. So therefore it's very important to ensure that the wheel is spigoted onto the hub. Do not use the wheel studs or wheel bolts to center the wheel and the hub. You definitely need a machine spigot that the wheel fits onto to make sure that it's concentric with the hub. That's what it rotates about. It's also worthwhile saying to you that sometimes tires aren't very round. Um, serious racers often will mount the tire and then put the wheel and tire assembly into a tire balancing machine and check that the outer periphery of the tire runs through. If it doesn't, they have various ways and means of shaving them to make sure that they do run through. Um, again, as I said, balance is very important. Um, the, the frequency of an out of balance wheel will start to resonate with the frequency of the springs. And then that starts to talk through the suspension and chassis arrangement. And the next thing you know, you're vibrating the contact patch at the ground and you lose grip. If you don't believe me, I'll give you a little practical uh, experiment for you to try. If you take an ordinary pencil with, with a, a, an eraser on the end of it, 
and you stand it up on the desk in front of you, razor end down, you put your finger on the point and push down on it. Okay. Now I want you to lean that pencil over a little bit, you know, maybe 10 degrees or 15 degrees, and the rubber will hold it there. Okay, still pushing down. Now what I want you to do is to thump the desk and that vibration will immediately make the rubber let go and the pencil will fall. The vibration has upset the, 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 the contact patch and the grip goes away. So there's no, no trick or no secret about this. This, this is well known. Okay, it's also important that dynamically your rotating elements, the hub and the wheels and whatever, are actually stiff enough to do the job. We'll talk about the connections to the chassis, about them needing to be stiff enough in a few minutes. But right at this point, I see a lot of Formula student cars where the hub face, or the, the hub itself, is actually insufficiently stiff to maintain a, you know, to man, man, maintain the, the wheel in its proper rotational position. Working from the outside in, so we start off with the tire, you choose the right tire, mount it on a wheel, make sure the wheel is straight, make sure the wheel is round, make sure the wheel runs true, make sure the tire runs true, and make sure that it's bolted to a hub, which also runs true, even under dynamic loads. All right. Um, anybody have any questions at this stage? Because we've got lots of time to do this. Andre, anybody want to ask any questions? Go. I have one small question. Uh, yeah. Do you plan to share your screen and show some uh, slides maybe? Uh, gee, I forgot about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I give you yeah. permission to do that so you can start. Okay. Okie doke, where are we? Yeah, I've got, I've got my screen here. Um, let's see, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Okay, yeah, I'll start be, uh, there. Okay. Um, now, oops, now how do I share this darn screen? Uh, hold on a second, I'm just a little lost, that's all. Okay, share the screen. Yeah, okay. That's the screen I want to share. Right there. Okay. You can see that? Yeah, we see the slides. Yeah, you see the slide. And there's a little man, and he is uh, he's pointing and smiling happily at his Goodyear tire. Um, uh, disclaimer, I have nothing to do with Goodyear. I have no, <laughs> no reason to recommend Goodyear's. All I can tell you is that from, uh, from my experience, looking at uh, the last couple of years, the tire that seems to work best in the real world seems to be that new, the current production Goodyear. It, um, it doesn't offer the ultimate grip but it certainly seems to be a very drivable and easy tire to, for, for a, an amateur driver to go fast on for a long period of time. It's the other thing with, uh, with um, a, a sticky tire, a tire with a very narrow edge, the, the driver gets very tired trying to, trying to drive on that edge to get the best from it over you know, the 20 laps or 22 laps, whatever it may be in the, in the endurance event. Okay, indisputable truth, as I said. The key to good road tile is keep your tires happy. We talked about dampers. Okay, here's the, here's the slide that's talking about keeping the tire happy uh, and needing it to keep it centered. Uh, wheel must be centered on the hub, tire assemblies must be balanced. We've covered all that stuff. Okay, all of that means that before the chassis or suspension uprights can be designed, First of all, the suspension general layout must be determined. Now, if the team decide to use any proprietary product, like buy it, bought off the, off the, um, off the, from the trade or from the internet, uprights or, or suspension components, or if they intend to use parts from last year's car, 
that's always going to compromise the design because uh, with the suspension geometry that they wish to use, once you run the suspension geometry in from the upright to the chassis, it's going to dictate where, where nodes or where loads should be fed in. And uh, that might not suit what you want to do with the chassis. It might well be that, you know, the side impact structure doesn't suit or, or something's in the way, but okay. With suspension, it's important to understand the in stiffness and the re reduction in any unwanted moments. Elimination of toe compliance, particularly at the rear, starts here. Now this is critical, okay? Elimination of rear toe compliance, that's the ability of the car to have compliance steer at the rear of the car is more important than having it at the front. Why do I say that? Because at the front, you've got a correction device. It's called the driver. At the back, you don't. So probably, and you know, Andre may well agree with me as a design judge, one of the biggest uh, design failures that we see in Formula student cars is a lack of rear toe compliance. You can actually grab the rear wheel and steer it by hand. Now a car like that will never be fast. Okay, so we'll talk about how you address those things. Okay, the first thing you do is you actually have a scrub radius at the rear as well as at the front. If you reduce the scrub radius at the rear of the car to close to zero, you take away the moment that's going to generate rear wheel compliance steer. Not totally, but you take away a great deal of it. So you'll notice I've marked that CP as the center of pressure. Scrub radius is not measured from the center of the wheel, as you've seen in, you see in so many uh, in so many uh, lectures or, or talks or, or whatever. You actually measure scrub radius from the center of pressure. And invariably, with the type of car that we're talking about, they run negative camber. And so the center of pressure is always going to be inboard of the center line of the wheel. As a rough rule of thumb, I always suggest make the center of pressure at this stage about one third of the way out from the inside edge of the tire. Okay. We haven't done anything about suspension yet. We've just found a point in space that we want to, uh, that we want to use. Okay, make sure I don't forget anything. Okay, this means, okay, that the bottom pickup point on your rear upright is probably going to have to be inside the wheel. All of a sudden, the importance of having space inside the wheel makes you realize that maybe a 13 inch wheel is not such a bad idea. If you have the uh, upright in board of the wheel, you're always going to have a rear steer moment caused by a, a rear scrub radius. Not a good idea. Okay. Then lay your bottom control arm horizontal to the ground and as long as practical. Why do I say that? Well, the geometry of that lower suspension arm is going to control the amount of scrub that's generated at the wheel as it travels vertically when the suspension works. Scrubbing the tire on the ground, tire not happy. That will give you an instant center outboard off the, the car somewhere. Is that important? Not a bit of it. Is the, the roll center important? At this stage, no, not a bit of it. What is important is that your suspension geometry keeps the tire within the camber window where it will work. Now, normally you will find that this is probably a number something like two degrees negative plus or minus one degree. 
It might be three degrees negative, plus or minus half a degree. I don't know. You work that out with the tire. But you need to keep the tire in that window. And what happens to the roll center or the instant center or whatever? Don't worry about that. Honestly, it's, it, it's, it's something that some old druids back in history decided was much more important than it actually is. Andre, you've been involved with the Formula One team right at the leading edge. How much importance do they place on roll centers and roll axes? Not a bit. It came more about the compliances. Absolutely. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. It may well mean, of course, too, that, that your upper outer uh, suspension pivot point will also be inside the wheel. Now, that means, of course, that... Uh, Again, a 13-inch wheel gives you more space. A 15-inch wheel would give you even more space, but I don't know of any suitable 15-inch tires for Formula Student cars. You can then change the amount of camber gain that you get as the suspension operates by changing or providing additional inner suspension pickup points. Make that top link either longer or shorter. Okay. As I said from here, don't fuss over a movement of the roll center. Any movement will cause the roll center to move. The roll center and the roll axis will move even when the driver sits in the car or when he moves the steering wheel five degrees. Okay. You need to locate the parallel links or the Z arm or the, the uh, toe control link as far apart as possible on that rear upright to give you compliance steer, a lack of compliance steer, steer, compliance control. If you do it at the bottom, it's sometimes a little difficult to get a good wide toe base out of the link because the wheel's getting in the way. Generally, the uprights are longer at the bottom than they are at the top because you want to bring the, up, the suspension links into the bottom of the chassis so that you're close to a node. It may be better to actually mount it the other way up. However, when it's at the bottom, it gives you a better load path for uh, push rods or direct acting suspension into the chassis at the top. Again, it's a, a decision needs to be made by, by your designers. I'm not teaching you or telling you how to design the chassis. I'm just talking about how to keep the tires happy. Okay. That's how the real people do it. That's an early model Dallara IndyCar. And you can see there, they have a, a, um, a top wishbone, a wide upright, and the toe link, which is as far away from the, uh, from the outer, outer upper suspension pivot as possible in order to keep that as stiff as possible to reduce compliance. That's the rear of the car, of course, because we can see the drive shaft here. Can you see that arrow on? Can you see my pointer on the screen? Yes. You can see my pointer? Yes, yes. Proceed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware whether that would show or not. Okay. Now, accommodating drive shaft geometry. It's not likely that you're going to be able to get drive shafts that actually pivot in absolute harmony with your uh, with your suspension operation so unless that's addressed you will end up with a binding mechanism which will fight against the suspension operating stiffen the suspension up and the tires don't like that so there needs to be some way to uh, accept the change in length in the rear drive shafts that is going to have to occur and splined couplings are probably not a good way to do that. There are better, better ways. Uh, start off with try get the drive shafts as close to parallel to the ground as possible. That does something else. That also gives you the location of your uh, rear differential, uh, inboard rear brakes, if you're using brakes, your, your, your drive line in the chassis. So what you can see happening here is that the suspension design is actually 
designing the chassis for you by telling you where all the stuff has to go. You can see there that the drive shaft actually passes through a tighter arc than the wheel. And as a result of that, we have a, a change of length of the drive shaft as it works. The best solution around at the moment is to use tripod joints. I think most teams actually use that these days. You'll find tripods at the, uh, on the drive shafts of almost every little front drive car out there. I'm sure there's something you can adapt. There's a tripod, tripod joint. Um, not only does it have the ability to change, it's a, form, it's a form of constant velocity joint. So it allows the, the drive shaft to articulate. It also accepts a, a, the plunge as the suspension operates, but it also works best when it actually operates and rolls back and forth working because that spreads the loads. So you don't get point loads and brindling inside that. Uh, this, this generally is called a tulip. Inside, you know, after the, after the flower. Okay. Do not use that. Um, a hook joint, a carnon joint, they're all right in some places on the car, but not in your drive shafts. Problem is that when they're not running straight, they have a variable acceleration, rotary acceleration, and that upsets the tires. Okay, let's talk about the front of the car. That's important too. Okay, first draw in the bottom link, parallel to the ground, and as long as practical, for exactly the same reason as you did at the rear. Okay, as I said here, you know, make the link as long as possible, as this will minimize track variation and, and scrub as the suspension moves. Think about this for a minute. Just time out for a sec. Um, if you turn a car into a corner at the maximum uh, amount of lateral grip that you can, that you can uh, generate, and the car starts to roll outboard as, because its center of gravity is higher than its, uh, than its roll axis, and if that suspension movement causes the wheel to be pushed outwards, that additional lateral movement has to, be has, to be ex has to be accounted for, and it actually comes away or subtracts from the performance that your car can, can develop. So you really need to keep that scrub, both ends of the car, as low as possible. Okay, same deal. Draw your line out to your instant center. Um, some teams like short virtual swing axle lengths. Some teams like long virtual swing axle lengths. Um, I would talk about, you know, two to two and a half times the track width at the rear and about three track widths at the front. You need less camber gain at the front than you do at the rear because you have something to help you with camber gain at the front. And that's the caster that you're going to use. Caster, uh, the, the effect of caster when you steer the car generates um, negative camber on the steered wheel, on the, on the loaded outside wheel. So you don't need quite as much um, camber gain at the front of the car as you do at the rear. The other reason why you'd keep a longer swing, virtual swing axle length at the front is to decrease the amount of camber gain that you get as the car dips under brakes. The front wheels are going to do the majority of your, um, of your braking and you want to keep those tires reasonably as flat as you can uh, whilst braking hard. Uh, you don't want them to stand up on their inside edge uh, because, because the brakes don't work very well then. Okay. from that point. Now, I said at the back of the car that you didn't need any scrub radius. And yet here I am drawing a little. Incidentally, these things are just pictures. They're not drawings. They're nothing to be scaled or copied. They're just illustrations to show what I'm talking about. You'll notice here I've showed a significant amount of scrub radius. 
That's deliberate. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's deliberate. The driver needs a little scrub radius at the front because he needs to feel, he needs to be doing some work when he's still. He needs to feel, to have some tact tactile feedback through the car when he steers it. But also something else. As the inside wheel turns in, the caster causes it to travel downward slightly and the outside wheel travels upward slightly. And that's going to generate some um, diagonal weight transfer. Uh, this is critically important if you have a spool. If the car doesn't have a differential, and there's no reason why it should have a differential, but uh, if you have a spool, you definitely need to generate some diagonal weight transfer in order to change the vertical loading on the tires so that they can generate different slip angles to allow you to turn the car. Okay, once again, I've said you can change the amount of camber gain that you get by changing the length of the top suspension link. And that's a very messy drawing. You have to look at it long and hard before you figure out what it's saying. But basically it's showing the suspension links here and the, and the steering link there. I've said an additional complication when designing the front suspension geometry is ensuring that the steering geometry is compatible. In other words, that you don't want bump steer or roll steer as much as possible. Um, Bump steer is where the wheel steers as the driver, as the wheel goes over a bump, either in bump or in droop. The wheel may tow in or tow out, depending on the, the geometry that you've got. Roll steer is when the car rolls, that the wheels may well steer, even though the driver's not putting in any, uh, any steering input at all. It's something we don't want, it's something you don't like, and it's something that's almost impossible to avoid completely. Um, however, you need as little as possible. There are some discussions about if you must have bump steer or roll steer, is it better to have a little bit of toe in or a little bit of toe out? I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to tell you that you should aim for as little as possible. Okay, before I move on, any Anybody got any questions at this stage? We're going to talk about anti dive and anti squat. <clears throat> Seems like no questions so far. <laughs> yeah, um, in, in, interesting. Andre, feel feel free to give them a copy of the the, uh, the thing I, I will. sent you. That yeah. Okay. Any geometry that you put into the car as anti-dive or anti-squat is actually a binding moment, it binding uh, mechanism in the suspension geometry. It takes the suspension away from the uh, from your springs and puts it into the suspension links and the tire then becomes the suspension. Obviously, the more anti-dive or anti-squat you have, the more that will occur. Uh, the tire doesn't really like to be the suspension mechanism, okay? So my recommendation to you is do not put any anti-dive or anti-squat into your chassis. However, if you feel that there is a need to prevent the car from diving under brakes or squatting at the back under, under acceleration, use a third element, a third spring and damper to do that. Lots of uh, pictures or whatever. In fact, I think I have some pictures here. Maybe farther down. Okay. Let's talk about looking after the tires when they're not on the car. There's some, some important lessons here. Firstly, do not let the car sit on its wheels 
when the tires are hot. So when you come in off the track, immediately pick the car off the ground, put it on a trolley and deflate the tires. Why? Well, the expanding gases as they come out of the tire, refrigerate the tire and cool it down very quickly. Heat is the enemy of your tires. Exposure to excess heat boils out the plasticizers and the oils that are used in making the tire and you want to do as little as possible of that. Um, get the tires, especially when they're hot, get the tires out of the sun, get them off the ground, deflate them. Okay, then when the tire is cool, use a rasper of file to remove the dead rubber and the pickup of any rubbish that comes off to, to clean the tire up and cover it, unless you're going back on the track. Oh. I said, it's best, it, I'm said the reason why you don't allow the car to sit on its hot tires is it develops flat spots. Um, flat spots give you vibrations and vibrations make unhappy tires. Okay, experience shows that it's best to lightly scrub the tires before use in competition. This is run by running them gently on the track for a little while and not sliding them. You actually see this currently in Formula One just before uh, the final qualifying when the drivers actually go out right at the end of qualifying and they do less than one lap on the tires that they're going to qualify in the third qualifying for pole position. That's because they just want to take the mold release oil and skin off uh, just clean the tires up and make them ready. Uh, it actually works even better if you can scrub the tires two or three laps, no more than that, no sliding or wheel spinning or abusing the tires, take them, deflate them, and allow them to sit overnight, and the next day they will be brilliant. Last longer because you've settled, you've settled the, whole, uh, the whole tire assembly down the, the, uh, the treads and the cords have had a chance to settle within the tire. And uh, the, you know, the tire is, uh, you know, the tire is actually performs more as it's designed to do. Usually runs faster and longer. Uh, as I said, you're trying to emulate real racers in inverted commas by going into an event on sticker tires, brand new tires. That's poor economy and it shortens the tire's life competitive life anyway. Remember that the people who do this usually aren't paying for their tires. You know, try on another set. Okay. Storing the tires. Keep the tires away from light, especially fluorescent lights, because the UV will damage the compound. You've all seen tires which haven't been stored properly and they turn a sort of a blue color. I recommend you that you steal them in black bags, garbage bin bags, storing them somewhere cool. The other thing that's hugely important is keep the tires away from ozone generators. This means keeping them away from compressors, generators, fridges, and most certainly away from welders. Okay, the ozone attacks the tires, hardens up the compound. Um, I've actually seen new tires destroyed by being incorrectly stored under a bench near where a compressor was running. Okay. Looking after the tires. Humidity, water in the inflation gas will materially hurt lap times and it may well damage the wheels through corrosion. Air from a compressor can be very, very wet unless it has been depressurized and drained regularly. And in my experience, that just doesn't happen. My suggestion is that if you can, dry nitrogen that you can buy from a welding supplier is a better inflation gas and should be used if possible. The beauty about nitrogen, apart from the fact that it's dry, is its molecular structure is bigger than, than, uh, than the oxygen. And so it doesn't leach through the tire itself. So the pressures stay constant. Uh, generally, the thing that causes big pressure increases in the tire 
when you're out on the track, running on the track, is firstly, any moisture in there condenses into steam and that raises the pressure. And secondly, the oxygen uh, expands, but nitrogen is much more, much more stable gas. So if there's no oxygen in there and no water in there, you'll have much more stable uh, tire pressures for the life of the tire. However, it probably also means that you need to start off with a slightly higher tire pressure than you normally would because generally you've decided on tire pressures based on practice using air and that's had the tire pressures increase when they got hot. So maybe two or three PSI more tire. You'll find that some tire manufacturers, I don't know whether this happens in Russia, but it certainly does here in Australia and uh, UK and the US, you actually buy tire gas. And what's tire gas? Well, tire gas is usually either dirty nitrogen or carbon dioxide that's been corrupted with some other gas trace. So they can't sell it as nitrogen or they can't sell it as CO2. What the heck are they going to do with it? Well, we put it in a bottle and sell it to you as tire gas. And it's usually quite cheap. Do you know if that exists, Andre? Do you know if that exists in Russia? Haven't asked. Don't know. I didn't hear the bottle. Okay. I didn't hear the bottle. Yeah. Okay. Looking after tires. So ensure the compressor is drained regularly and use a water trap in the supply line or use dry nitrogen from a welling gas supplier. Okay. Monitoring tire pressures. That's important. Okay. This is a, a, a Rotex uh, cart tire pressure device that actually allows you to, to measure, uh, notate on, on the little device what the tire pressures are all around. Okay. Tire pressure measurement. Okay. Don't use an infrared gun. Okay. All an infrared gun reads is the surface temperature of the tire and that degrades rapidly. When you're coming in off the track, just the unloaded use of the tire coming from where your competition running is finished to where you drive into the pits means that the tire, pre the tire temperatures will have fallen off. The other thing is, it's not really the tire temperature at the surface that we're interested in. It's actually the tire temperature in the core. So you need a proper tire temperature gauge that actually has a probe that you probe under the, under the tread in three positions across the tread to measure and log your tire temperatures. In big time motorsport, they do use infrared tire temperature gauges, usually mounted on the car. And sometimes there are five or even seven of them for each wheel but they measure the temperature in real time, which is a different thing to what you're doing, which is measuring the temperature after the car comes off the track. Log the tire temperatures, okay? You can buy or make null pads to re record your tire temperatures and pressures. The temperature should be slightly higher on the inner edge, decreasing slightly at the center and outside edge. Um, you know, you, you will definitely don't want the tire pressures higher at the outside edge. If the tire pressures are higher at the outside edge, you haven't got enough negative camber. You need to crank another half a degree or degree of camber into the car and try again. Okay, I've said slick tires only work properly when they're hot. Um, you can see here, the tire temperatures of about 80 degrees C to 85 degrees C are about the number that you should be looking for in the soft compound for your student tires. Uh, it used to be for many years that the old rule of thumb was that the tires should reach the boiling point of water, it's 100 degrees Celsius, but this is a bit high for Formula student tires, which are, which are much softer. If you start to run Formula student tires up at those temperatures, they literally fall to pieces very quickly. Um, Tire temperature probe points, proper probe points on the outer edge, middle, and the inner edge. When you're checking the tire temperature, insert the probe at an angle into a depth of about one millimeter into the thread, and take care that you don't puncture the tire. Yeah, so as I said, by probing at the points, you can determine overinflation, the middle reading too high, 
under inflation, the edge readings are too high. Or, as I said earlier, if the outer edge is hotter than the inner edge, you don't have enough uh, negative camber, so you need to dial in some negative camber. Never, ever, ever allow a situation where either through geometry or compliance, your outside loaded tires ever go into positive camber. In fact, I'd say never even let them get vertical. Always keep some negative camber on those tires to, to more. No. Five degrees of negative camber is sometimes not too much. Okay. Okay, looking at the tires, we'll look, look at some tire stuff. This cupping wear, up here where the arrow is, you can see that the tire wear is cupped and it's also abraded. It's caused by too much negative camber. It's, oh, what happened there? Okay, it's not an effect of the incorrect toe setting. Otherwise, the running between the corners would erase the waves that I'm talking here about the waves. So if, if it were something other than camber, like an incorrect toe setting, too much toe out, in other words, uh, that would be erased, the, the waves would be erased by the running between corners. Uh, this tire, incidentally, has reached the end of its competitive life. It will never recover. You can't bring it back. So it's only used for, um, for practice or whatever. You could demount it, take it off the, uh, off the rim and turn it over. If the tire is not directional, you'd actually turn it around and use it as a practice tire. But as far as a competitive tire is concerned, that tire is actually finished. Its life is, is, has gone. Okay. Camber wear. Okay. This tire was set with excessive negative camber or the, sus yeah, or the suspension kinematics result in excessive camber gain. Note side, the outside edge is almost untouched, but the inside edge is cupped and worn. Again, you can see the cupping and the scrubbing like the other tire. Um, this tire is also dead and buried, gone. You know, again, as I said, you could roll it over, uh, mount it the other way on the rim, to use as a practice tire or a driver training tire. But as far as its competitive life on the car is, is uh, considered, it's gone. A word for the wise. Never, ever, ever try to set your car up using old tires, worn out tires, or, or tires which reach the end of their life. What will happen is you will start to try adjust the car to make the best use of the poor tires that you've got. And then when you put fresh new ones on, the setup will be so far away, it will be almost undrivable. Uh, sad thing, but you know, tires are a consumable. They're expensive, an expensive consumable, um, but you need to be able to change them when you need to change them. So there's no point in deciding at the beginning of the year, oh, we only need two sets of tires, one to set the car up and get it going and practice, and then we'll put a new set on for the event. You're probably gonna need more tires than that. Okay, what's the next one? Whoa, that tire has just been run too hard out of the blocks. It's been, as you see, it's been torn up. It's not been bedded. Uh, the tire is, is literally, literally been destroyed. Generally, you won't see this on a Formula student car because generally they don't generate enough power to do this. This obviously from a rear tire. You can see the, um, the, the, the drive wear in the middle of it. Also looks like its tire pressure may have been a bit high. Oops, as I said down here, properly bedded tires be faster and more stable. So thrashing brand new tires, not a good idea. Mm. Graining, which is what we've got here, is what occurs when the slick tire is overloaded in shear, especially before the tire is fully warmed up. The stresses in a tire when fitted to a rim are very different to those in manufacture. So it does give a better chance of the tire performing as it was designed if you allow it to have a heat cycle and settle in first. This tire has just, just been torn up, just been overloaded. Okay, we have here a tire which is 
I've said is close to the limit of being abused. Some grainy is obvious here, but this will probably clean up. This tire has had a very aggressive heat cycle and despite plenty of thread left, significant levels of competitors will, will have lost. Now this tire actually came off a car, they, the tires were fitted new for the uh, autocross event. So obviously they were driven as hard as the drivers could drive them at the autocross event um, and uh, left them in that state to run in the, uh, in the endurance event. I couldn't tell you because I can't remember if they ran into tire issues late in the endurance event, but I wouldn't have been surprised if they did. If the, uh, if the level of competitiveness of the tire, the grip had gone away towards the end of the endurance. Um, what's the answer? Well, I guess the answer would have been to put new tires on for the endurance event, but okay. Did we have that before? Yeah, okay. This front tire exhibits a symptom from an understeering car. You can see that the uh, the tire is actually grained up on the inside edge. Uh, the driver is basically sliding on the on the um, on the on the inside edge of the tire uh, with too much lock on. The additional lock has actually given him on that outside front tire. That's outside front tire. This one has given him more excessive camber, and so the car the tire has been sitting up on this inside edge and literally sliding on it. So the car with far too except to a uh, um, far excessive understeer has generated this type of wear on the inside. You can see the outside of the tire is actually in good shape. The inside of the tire is not good. Again, a tire that's uh, probably reached most of the end of its usefulness. I'd be turning that one over. That one would probably, that would probably come back. Okay, this tire, this shows a tire that's been overheated after very little use. The cause here is a thread that's too soft for the conditions. And I've said, yes, it is possible to choose tires that are too soft. This tire was actually an uncut wet weather tire. The wet weather tires are very, very soft compound tires. And this one was supplied on wet. And then run in an event where the temperature was very hot, like the temperature was, uh, you know, maybe close to 40 degrees Celsius and the, the track temperature would probably would have been 60 degrees Celsius or more. The result is you can see the tire is almost melting. To drive on that tire when it feels, I've done this and I can tell you it's not funny. When you drive on a tire like this, it feels greasy. It almost feels like the, like the track is wet. Whoops. Yeah, almost feels like the track is wet and you're, you, you agree that the, the grip has just, just gone away, almost as if the oils are coming out of the tire and lubricating the grip between you and the ground. And of course, that's not fast. So yes, it is possible tires that are too soft. Um, a common choice of tire that's too soft that I see is when people choose, you see this in England, they choose the softest compound Avon hill climb car, tire. Uh, now in England, the weather is usually cold and not really a problem. But if you have a hot meeting, it works, certainly can be a problem. What's the next one? Okay, this tire is overheated and blistered. You can see that it's actually bubbled up. And uh, what happens is the, the tire being overheated causes the, the compounds in the tire to gas up and that blows little blisters on the tire and then they get worn off or shredded away. And so you end up with these chunks missing out of the thread. Um, again, a compound too soft for the condition, car being driven too hard on new tires. Um, you've seen a few of those, have you Andre? <laughs> Andre, have you seen a few of these on Formula One yeah. uh, qualifying tires? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, blistered. Okay, 
this one here is an interesting one. This is, shows the importance of obeying the rotational arrows. If there are marks on the tire telling you which way the tire has to rotate, make sure you pay attention to that because this relates to how the tread compound has been laid on the tire to start. Some tires, the tread compound has been laid on in a long strip, which just winds its way across the tire. But in others, it's just a big slab that goes around the tire. And if you run them the wrong way, you start to open up the splice. And this, of course, can eventually lead to a tire failure. You can actually throw the tread off. So pay attention to the arrows. If it's got a directional arrow, um, sometimes it'll say, you know, the directional arrow will be different for front and back. It will say this way to the front, uh, this way forward at the front and this way forward at the back, because obviously it's acceleration torque at the back of the car and braking torque at the front of the car that will start to open up the splice. Okay. I said that tire been run at the upper limit of its temperature gauge. You can see it's been melting. It will clean up if you clean off all the rubbish but a lot of the plasticizers have been boiled out. Uh, this tire will get hard in long-term storage. Uh, the plasticizers have boiled out. Its competitive life is finished. One thing that comes to mind then is, oh, well, if the plasticizers burn out and the tires get hard, can't you just paint some stuff on them and make them soft again? Well, you can, but it's not a good idea. Uh, this is a wet, using a wet weather tire in hot in dry conditions. A team which came to the Australian event um, with only one set of tires. Uh, somehow or other, they thought it must rain a bit in Australia, and they brought wet weather tires. We had a scorching hot event, and that's after just one run. You can see the the tire literally melting off the rubber, melting off the tire. Yeah, they thought they'd have an advantage using their wet weather tires in the autocross event. They were wrong. Okay, if you're going to move the car around on hot tires, the rubber will pick up debris, can't perform properly, so you should have tire covers. Either wrap them up with plastic like this or get some proper, uh, some proper um, tire covers. I'm sure there's somebody, somebody's mum will make them for you. Uh, yeah, so moving, rolling the car around, make sure the tires are covered. It's all too easy to just run over a self-tapping screw that some team have dropped or whatever, go out on the track and next thing you've got a puncture. Okay, that's what they should look like. Doesn't that look good? That's a nicely, you know, tread wears even across the tread, just a small band of graining. This is the result of the negative camber needed to make the tire work best. Okay, now, Talking about storage, you know, I talked about tires being stored incorrectly and being damaged by, by um, ozone. Well, here's an example. These tires were put away without being cleaned up, without being wrapped, and they were stored near a compressor. And you can see what's happened. It's also easy to see which tire was nearer the compressor. You can see the blue, the blue color. Those tires, unfortunately, are ruined. Again, practice tires. Okay, now I mentioned tire softening fluids. Don't do it, okay? They may improve performance for a very short period of time, but afterwards the performance is worse. What happens, you paint tires. This, this is endemic in karting. Carters love this stuff. But after about four laps, the tires are worse than they were before. And at the end of a, a, a session, the tires end up, they just end up being as hard as, as, hard as wood um, because the, the solvents actually carry away the plasticizers and, you know, the tires are ruined. Even worse, every tire manufacturer will tell you, do not use tire softeners. Do not use chemicals on the tire. There's a reason why they do this, and that's why. Here we have some tires which were used. These are actually off a production car, but that doesn't matter what, what tire they're off. These tires were rolled in a bath of tire softener, uh, raced, and you can see that what's happened is that the, the bond between the thread and the, 
and the, uh, the the carcass of the tire, the belt of the tire, has actually failed, and the tread has been thrown off. These are both rear tires, by the way. Okay, the last thing in the world you need is a tire failure. Tire failures lead to accidents, and accidents leave people hurt. Okay, time to talk about, I said I'd talk about dampers a little later. We talked about tires. Before we leave tires, anybody got any questions about tires before I leave? Andre? Uh, yeah, <laughs> tell them not to be shy. It's only Pat. I'm not going to yell at them. <laughs> okay. First of all, the majority of teams in their design aim for a one-to-one -one motion ratio. But in fact, the actual ratio between wheel travel and the push rod or the pull rod or direct acting coil over is more like 0.6 to 1. Now, this means that 25 millimeters of bump travel at the wheel gives you about 15 millimeters of shaft travel in the damper. So if you just go over a little five millimeter bump, that would only move the damper about three millimeters. And at three millimeters of damper travel, you're really only rattling the valve washers. You're not, the damper's not working at all. Um, obviously the tires don't like this, that's not a good idea. I can't understand why, if teams want to use push rods or, or uh, pull rods particularly, like use belt cranks in their suspension, why they don't use a more aggressive, uh, aggressive uh, motion ratio in order to get more damper travel, more spring travel for any given amount of wheel travel. Okay. For a student, dampers typically have 75 or 80 millimeters of travel, yet the typical designs only use about half of that. You know, they're, uh, they, the, the rules limit you to about 50 millimeters of wheel travel, and most teams will try to design down to 50 millimeters, not much more. But with our 0.6 uh, motion ratio, that means that, you know, it's only about 35 millimeters of travel in that damper is actually being used, less than half the travel that the damper can provide. Uh, if you're using direct acting suspension, there is very little you can do about this, but there is a few sneaky tricks that I'll show you in later, in later slides. There are um, cars built with uh, suspension designs with direct acting suspension that actually utilize uh, more damper travel. Why would you want to use more damper travel? Well, in simple terms, the cheaper the shock absorber, the cheaper the damper is, the less effective it's going to be in short amounts of travel. Very expensive dampers like Olin's and Penske's and whatever, they may work very well in very small uh, increments of travel. But with most teams using, well, if they don't have the budget to, uh, to buy Olin's or Cane Creek or Penske or whatever dampers, um, they can settle for something maybe a little less sophisticated. And by increasing the damper travel, they can actually make cheap shock absorbers, cheap dampers actually work like expensive dampers. We'll talk about it in a while. Okay. It's a typical direct acting suspension system. Uh, the damper has been extended with this extension down here. It's a Cane Creek damper. Uh, if you do the, the calculations, do the mathematics, you'll find that the motion ratio in here is about 0.6 to 1. So if the wheel mount travels 100 millimeters, the damper only travels 60 millimeters. Of course, the wheel's never going to travel 100 millimeters. It's been done this way to feed the suspension load into a node at the top level of the chassis. But just between you, me, and the wall, if it were me, I'd have actually mounted it the other way because we have a fairly chunky, heavy damper with its weight up the top at all four corners. By reversing the, uh, the damper and fitting the heavy end at the bottom, we would have had a measurable lowering of the center of gravity. Do you remember Pat's three rules? 
I'll cover them again. <laughs> okay. Pat's rule number one says that all things being equal, same tires, same drivers, same engines, same, the car with the low, lightest weight will win. You know, F equals MA hasn't been changed. That's always the way. Second rule is that all things being equal, the car with the lowest center of gravity will win. You know, want to keep that weight as low as possible. And the third rule is that all things being equal, the car with the lowest polar moment of inertia will win. So you need to centralize the weight, lower the weight, and reduce the weight. And in this case, mounting, I would have mounted those dampers the other way up to get a measurable reduction in the, um, in the uh, uh, center of gravity. I'd also uh, maybe get a reduction in the moment of inertia in roll. However, that's probably not so important. All right, what do we got next? Okay. In the 60s and 70s, when direct acting suspension was the state of the art, how all cars were made like that, the dampers were relatively crude devices. They had about the same technology inside as the strut that holds the tailgate on your car open. The popular damper at the time were Coney's, the Dutch, the Dutch damper company, and they were adjustable uh, in both bump and droop together, like in, in bump and rebound together, but you had to take them off the car, strip them down, and then you adjusted them by compressing the damper rod all the way to the bottom, where the end of the damper engaged an adjuster, and then you could click them in or out. What most people did was they would push the damper rod down, click all the way to the stop in one direction, count the number of clicks back in the other direction until they reached the stop, and then put the damper rod back halfway, assemble it, put it on the car, and forget about it. We didn't have the sophisticated data measuring equipment that we have today, but that's basically what we did. And that was that's where we learned about these things. Okay. Now, motocross. In the 1970s, the motocross riders discovered the advantages of long travel suspension. And they found that when they lowered the dampers down, they got much more wheel travel. Like so, uh, motocross bikes went from perhaps rear wheel travel of perhaps 100 millimeters to maybe 250 millimeters. But the problem they have, of course, is that the motion ratio, all of a sudden, although they had a lot of wheel travel, their dampers weren't traveling very far. So they were actually running into the same issue that I was just talking about uh, with our 0.6 motion ratio in, 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 in cars. So a lot of money in motocross racing, especially for the Japanese bike manufacturers, they all want to win. So they started to develop suspension geometry or linkages to increase the travel in the damper. Talking another, another issue, I'll go back. Another issue with this type of suspension and also with your um, 0.6 to one motion ratio on your car is that the suspension rate becomes digressive. So if, uh, if one inch of travel takes 100 kilograms, the second inch of travel won't take 200 kilograms, it'll take maybe 180 or something like that. So it's not progressive, it's not aggressive, it's digressive, it falls away. Uh, that meant bottoming out from big bumps. Uh, it, meant, it meant a thing that we called in motocross, the flying W. What the flying W was, was when you came off a big bump, the rear suspension bottomed, rebounded, the driver was pitched off the... Uh, off the bike and his legs made a big W as he went over the handlebars <laughs> before he bit the dirt. Yeah, flying Ws. I did a few. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Sus yeah, so suspension designers wanted to design a linkage system to improve the motion ratio. They understood. Now, it also forced the development of some pretty trick new dampers. And this is where Olens came from. Olens was actually a Swiss, Swedish company who made the best motocross dampers back in the 70s. Um, the company was eventually bought by Yamaha, still maintained the, the Olens brand. 
uh, and they, you know, they were they were very expensive, but they were they were the best dampers that money could buy in the day, and that probably holds true till till now. Now, all of the bike manufacturers came up with a mechanical solution to increase the spring travel, damper travel in their rear suspension. But the best was Suzuki's full floater system. This system actually compressed the damper from both ends. So it effectively doubled the damper travel and resulted in much more effective travel. Okay, here's how the system worked. You have like the swing, this is the pivot at the chassis. Here's the swing axle. So the rear wheel is out here somewhere. Then you have push rods into this bell crank rocker arrangement, which compress the spring. But you'll notice that the bottom end of the shock absorber is also mounted to the damper, to the, to the swing axle. So as the, as the uh, swing arm compresses, uh, comes up, it compresses the damper from this end and the bell crank compresses the damper from that end. Uh, it was, the best in the world, and Suzuki attempted to patent it. And when they tried to patent it, they discovered somebody already owned the patent. And so they were forced to drop it and come up with another system. And it cost them a lot of money because, of course, they had they sold thousands, thousands and thousands of bikes with that suspension system. And uh, it became, I had friends who worked for uh, for Suzuki at the time, and they began to refer to it not as full floater, but semi-sinker. They're semi-sinker. It just about sunk the company. It cost them millions in, uh, in patent infringement fees. Okay. This system has been used by some race car makers. Like, it's possible for you to design a linkage to actually compress the damper from both ends and enable the use of relatively cheap dampers to perform much better than you would otherwise expect. The two examples that I'll show you in the next slides, one is from a store car, which is a, an American brand of, of uh, sports racing car. And the other one is from Radicals, which are an English car, which is used all over the world. But uh, I'll, get to, I'll show you those pictures in a sec. Uh, the students don't do a good job of either implementing or justifying the bell cranks in their suspension. Often the justification we're given is because race car. And if a team say that to me as a judge, that pisses me off. That's just, you know, th that's, that's insulting the intelligence of the judges because race car. It's not a race car, it's a Formula student car. Um, an answer like that gets no points. Have you had that issue, Andre? Andre, have you, have you been told because race car? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and what do you think of that? <laughs> Not happy. Okay, the bell, cranks yeah. bell cranks give the designer the opportunity to increase the spring and damper travel relative to wheel travel, but so few take advantage of it, as you can see here. In this case, you can see that the travel, like this, this dimension and this dimension are almost the same. So the belt, there's, there's almost no multiplication all this team have managed to do is to move their coil spring dabber from down here somewhere all the way up to here. So they've raised the center of gravity. The, the damper travel is um, basically the same as if it was mounted directly on this angle here. And meanwhile, they've, uh, they have uh, introduced like a whole number of opportunities for compliance. Compliance is your enemy. You know, that's, that's, yeah. Okay. A team, this team could not justify to me why they've done that. I know why they've done it. They know why they've done it, but they can't justify it as, as a design, as a design feature, feature of their car. That offered nothing except additional complication, additional uh, hard points required on the chassis, uh, more parts count, uh, you know, there is no advantage there. And yet 85% of all the Formula student cars we see in the world kind of look like that. You can do better. You can do better. Okay. Here we have the store system. Have a look at this. What store have done is they've got their push rod and they have a bell crank 
and they, the damper is attached to the bell crank, but lo and behold, the other end of it is attached to the push rod. So this damper is actually being compressed from both ends. It doesn't require any additional mounting points on the chassis. It still has like upper and lower suspension pickup points and a suspe suspension mounting point. So uh, you know, it still has the advantage of being able to change the ride height by changing the, the push rod length. Um, yeah. Worth looking at. As I, as I said, uh, Andre can give you the copies of this. Okay, let's see what Radical do. Okay, what Radical have done is a bit more, it's a bit more difficult to see, but here's Radical's bell crank here. So they have a push rod from their lower suspension component, lower suspension arm. This is the push rod here, and it pushes on the bottom end of that bell crank. And the bell crank then pushes on the coil spring damper unit, which is attached to the wishbone. So, oops, it's another. Once again, we have the damper being compressed from both ends. So you have additional damper travel. You can use softer springs. Um, yeah, a lot of benefits. A lot of benefits for 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 doing that. There are more ways to do it. Yeah. Okay. This is another another uh, example of the the uh, radical. It's a better picture actually. You can see that the bottom end of the damper is attached to the bottom wishbone here. Then there's a push rod, which operates the bell crank, and the bell crank compresses the damper from the top end. A different, a different radical, but the same idea. Incidentally, don't do that using uh, using uh, nylon bushes instead of spherical joints or rose joints or prime joints or ball joints at the suspension. Is that's just a cheap way out. Okay, back to push rods and pull rods. Okay. One of the main advantages of using bell cranks is the ability to multiply wheel travel to gain more damp damper travel. But as I said, the benefit is not used by most teams who usually plump for a one-to-one -one motion ratio. I don't know why. Compressing the boat spring from both ends increases the, the spring and in particular the damper travel for any given wheel movement. This enhan enhances the damper travel. Okay, now the next slide shows a space frame race car. This one's a Pikes Peak hill climb, hill climb car. It's got a sophisticated three element suspension system. In other words, it's got no anti-dive or anti-squat in the car. It uses an additional coil spring damper at each end, one which is used to prevent uh, dive in brakes and one which is used to prevent uh, squat at the back under acceleration. The reason I show it here is that the, the bell crank ratios as used in mainstream motorsport, like, you know, this one, it multiplies the travel by about five times. Okay, you can see here, here's the, here's the, uh, the geometry of it. So the one leg of the triangle is here. The other leg of the triangle is here. You can see this dimension is much farther than this. Okay. So a little bit of wheel travel results in a lot of damper travel. I'll explain, if you like, the, the third element, which is this one here. From the damper, it's got two rods, actuating rods, which go to this T-bar. When the car, this is the front of the car, so if the car goes to dive uh, under brakes, both push rods, suspension push rods, push up, compress the dampers, the dampers pull this T-bar back, and that it brings into compression the uh, the center the center uh, cord spring damper unit. When the car rolls in a corner, one push rod comes up and the other one goes down. So what happens is that the one damp one push rod pulls, or one actuation rod pulls, the other one pushes, and that actually pivots this T. It does not compress this damper, but what it does do is it twists this torsion bar. So this torsion bar down here is in fact the anti-roll bar that's used in this car. So wrapped up in this nice little package, we have uh, bell cranks that offer a realistic uh, 
motion ratio. We have a three spring arrangement at the front of the car and, a, and a, quite a tidy, it's called a T bar, a D row system. Okay, that's the back of the same car. Okay, in this case, exactly the same geometry. We have the uh, the uh, bell cranks. So you've got here's the the geometry of the bell crank. You've got this lever acting on that lever, so it compresses the the rear dampers much more. Again, we have the actuation rods back to a T bar and a row bar, and the uh, and the third element, which in this case is compressed to stop the car from squatting at the back. Now, something I don't like about this car is look up here. The, the, remember I talked earlier about needing a nice wide tow base to prevent tow compliance at the rear of the car? That's not enough. This car will have rear wheel compliance steer. A better answer for this would have been to make uh, top, top A arms Oh, hang on, I'm sorry. Make top, top arms that actually picked up back here. This arm could have been almost straight out from the chassis, could have picked that back out here, and that arm could have been from the chassis, not from the A arm, but straight out to make this toe base as wide as possible, like we saw in the Dallara Indy car that I showed you a picture of a little later. Okay, that's a, a West is a another. Um, American um, American sports car. Once again, having a look at the bell crank geometry, you can see that you know one lever arm is that length, the other lever arm is this length. Again, it has a third element. Here's the the T bar and your roll bar is here. In this case, it's got a long push rod down to a set of Belleville washers. So they're not using a coil spring damper here. They're just using a set of Belleville washers as a spring. Uh, but again, this car is uh, a motorcycle powered. So you can see it's got uh, chain drive, it's very like a uh, very like a Formula student car. Okay. 85 slides, enough for this presentation. <laughs> what I've tried to show you is that there are Lots of aspects of keeping your tire happy. Happy tires make for a fast car, one that's easy to set up and easy to drive. This is very important. Don't think that you can build a car that you need Lewis Hamilton to drive. Because, sorry, there are no Lewis Hamiltons in your team. Uh, you know, you need a car which is friendly, has good feedback, has, a, uh, has an edge of between grip and slip in the tires that's reasonably wide so that it talks to the driver. The driver can feel when he's approaching the edge. It's not going to break away suddenly and, and cause him to spin, you know, when he's trying to turn with the brakes on or something. And uh, at that point, it's time to shoot some ball. In other words, I'm here to answer questions. Any questions? Bad hello. <clears throat> hello there. Uh, my question, uh, is it possible to uh, adequately adjust the weight distribution of the car by changing the suspension stiffness using floor scales uh, under the wheels? No, it's not. Um, it's possible to redistribute the weight, um, but you're not going to change the weight under the car um, front to rear. If you, if you want to change the, the weight balance front to rear, um, it's, uh, it, it's probably going to need to have, you know, the wheelbase change. Probably the usual way that you would do that would be with alternative suspension components that moved either the front wheels forward or the rear wheels back or vice versa. However, of course, it is possible and, and desirable to put the car on scales and to adjust the wheel weights um, to give like to, so that they're, they are equal across the car. 
But one little trick that I'll tell you and something that nobody ever tells you is that a lot of teams go to a great deal of trouble to make sure that their car is set up symmetrically. In other words, the same weights across the rear axles and across the front axles, the same cambers across the rear axles and across the front axles. But in fact, there's nothing symmetrical about what you're doing. If you think about, if you turn a lap of the endurance event, you're always going to turn 360 degrees more in one direction than in the other direction. And if you multiply that by you know, 20 laps, that's over 7,000 degrees more turning in one direction than the other direction. So maybe there is some benefit to be given away to maybe lose a little bit on the left-handers to gain a bit more on the right-handers or vice versa, depending on which way the track goes. Does that make sense to you? Uh, same you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> you, you, can stay and, and you can stay and discuss for a while. What, uh, what time do we have to finish? What, what time do we finish? How much longer have we got? <laughs> okay, so but we have, have uh, we have 15 minutes more. For 15. 15. 15. 15 minutes. Yeah, one yeah. five. Yeah, okay. Um, that's all right. I'm here. Um, I don't I don't think his question about uh, about weight movement was fully answered. Is is he happy with what I told him? Okay, he needs some time to uh, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, tell him, tell him he can he, give him my email address, he can email me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, probably yeah, I should give some explanation more later yeah. here during this yes, you seminar. Can. Yeah, you can you can uh, you can give the the attendees my email address. They can email me, and I'll I'll advise them. Okay. Okay. Looks like you've got somebody else queuing up for a question. Have you? Hello, Brett. Hello. Uh, Do I know uh, you? Uh, I'm fine. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Have we met before? How, um, my question is, uh, how much does frame stiffness impact on steering and why? Ask me again, please. I couldn't quite understand you. That's better. How, how much Hello. Does, <laughs> uh, yes. How much does frame stiffness impact on steering, steering and why? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, but I still don't understand what you're asking me. I wish I spoke Russian. <laughs> you, how much? How much does frame stiffness impact on steering and why? How much does the suspension? No. <laughs> explain to explain to Andre what you're asking. Don't don't be embarrassed. You're. Okay, uh, the question was uh, word by word, uh, how much the frame stiffness uh, influence uh, uh, oh, on the, okay. the car. Yeah, okay. Uh, it was just please, a little bit quiet. Yes, please tell Fran that um, she should not be embarrassed that her English is much, much better than my Russian. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Ask her to come back. I'll talk to her. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I understand. And um, what I wanted to say to you is do not be embarrassed because your English is much, much better than my Russian. 
<laughs> okay. So your question really is about, about chassis stiffness, how important chassis stiffness is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look, um, chassis stiffness is relatively important, but maybe not as important as you might think. Um, there is a rule of thumb that says the chassis stiffness, like the, the uh, torsional stiffness of your chassis, should be one order of magnitude greater than the roll stiffness. Now, obviously that means that if you're running a very stiff suspension, the chassis needs to be very stiff. That's why Formula One cars, which have almost no suspension, have torsional stiffness uh, almost indescribably stiff. Um, you'll find, it, t tell me about your car. You, what sort of car are you building? Is it a space frame car, uh, a, a, a monocoque car? What, what, what you, what's your car? Space frame car. Space frame car, yeah. Okay, if about anything better than about 2,000 Newton meters per degree uh, would be satisfactory with your space frame car. Remember, your suspension is not going to be really stiff. A car with a really stiff suspension uh, won't keep its tires heavy, <laughs> and it will be difficult to drive, especially as most Formula student tracks are rough. But if you can, if you can get 2,000 as a good number, or maybe better, you might get, you might get 3,000. Um, it it becomes what's called a law of diminishing returns, that as you add stiffness, you're probably going to add weight. And as you add weight, um, you're gaining no real advantage, just uh, F equals MA. So as I said, a, a number, don't, don't, yeah, don't uh, get too concerned with making the car excessively stiff. Uh, obviously, uh, there, there, there are two sorts of stiffness you should worry about. One is the total torsional stiffness and bending stiffness of your chassis. But the other is the points stiffness. Now, by that, I mean uh, a lack of compliance at single areas within the chassis, like where the driver's seat fits or where the steering wheel is attached or where the springs attach to the chassis. So you want to reduce compliance in those places. That's why we always suggest that you try to get those loads fed into the nodes where it's possible. Um, I, you know, it, 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 becomes, it becomes a matter of uh, having to design almost everything before you design the chassis, because until you know where the forces are going, you don't know where you're going to have to react them. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so which university are you from? St. Petersburg University. From, yeah. Okay. And uh, this is your first event? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. <laughs> you look like you're going to cry. No. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> it's only Pat you're talking to. <laughs> yeah. All right. If that help, if that helps. Yeah. Um, Andre will give you my email address if you want to email me and talk about this further. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Если ты просто, то есть, ты просто разговариваешь.
Hello, Pat. Hello, how are you, Alex? <laughs> do you remember me? Of course I do. Uh, some, somewhere, sometime, um, I saw you. I can remember, maybe Taliati. It was in Taliati and it was, again was in Moscow. Moscow? Uh, yeah. Moscow. Last time Antoliati. in Moscow. And Taliati. Anyway, uh, how you do you do? You, I'm well. asking you, you said? about your health. Yeah, no, we we don't have uh, we don't have much of a COVID problem in Australia. Um, currently, I think we have about uh, about sixty people in hospital, and we're getting here in New South Wales maybe one or two new infections each day. That's all. So quite different to other places in the world. But I'm well. My wife's well. We everything's uh. wonderful. <laughs> Uh, I have one question, if it's possible, course, uh, no. I need uh, a short, uh, short answer. Uh, what, 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 uh, what do you think? Um, uh, what should be? Uh, what should be camber and, and front, uh, front uh, will informal student? Usually, um, usually. Yeah, look, it, usually it's about two, it's about two, two and a half degrees negative. Okay. But uh, However, what do you think about 1.5? Yeah, that's all right. If that's what works, that's what works. Um, what, what, uh, what you can, um, what, that, that's why when I talked in the talk about measuring the temperatures across the tire, that's when we'll tell you is the best camber setting for your particular car on your particular tire. Uh, what tire are you, are you using? Uh, Hoosier. Okay, so uh, Hoosier is a... 30 inch, 30 inch, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, so the Hoosier tire is a cross-ply tire like a bias belted tire, and they require less camber than a radial ply tire. So one and a half degrees might be a good number. Um, I would, my, my recommendation usually is to teams to start at about the two degree mark and, uh, and go back or forth from there. Maybe a little less at the back, one and a half degrees at the back, maybe two to two and a half degrees at the front. But yeah. You know, it, it, it's something that yes, you yes, yes, thank you. Pardon? Thank you, Pat. No, no trouble. Hello, Pat. Hello, hello. Hello. Seems like we're going to finish the lecture now, and we're very thankful to you for uh, giving, us, giving us your knowledge again. And we will we would be happy, we would be very happy to see you here again in Taliati, in Russia. So I've I've been to Toliati in Russia. I've made a I did a presentation in your university. Yes. Yeah, a few years ago. Yes. Yeah. So I was still watch it. <laughs> oh, it was recorded, was it? Yes. Yeah. Um okay, you have a question? Um no, I don't have, and I think the students especially in Europe will need, and I think students also don't have it. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we've got a few minutes. Um, they, the, the students can hear me. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you some final words of wisdom. <laughs> okay. Okay. To have a successful Formula student team, you need 
three things. Okay? You need people. You need money. And you need time. Now, if you haven't got enough people, you can always get more people. You know, I'm sure there's students at the university who'd be interested in being involved. If you haven't got enough money, and no team ever had enough money, teams always need more money, but you can always get more money. I mean, you can, uh, you know, find another sponsor or, you know, reorganize how you, how you uh, spend your money or have some fundraising event to, to raise some more money. However, you can't get any more time. You know, there's an old saying, nine women cannot make a baby in one month. Okay, so the time that you've got for the project is limited to the time that you've got. So it's probable that the most important aspect of your whole formula student project is managing the time. Because if you don't get done in time, the organizers of the event, they sort of, I won't say they don't care, but it's not their, it's not their business. Um, if you don't get finished in time or you don't have your testing done or your driver training done or whatever done in time for the event, then it's easy for your whole year's work to just be almost wasted. So most important that you have a time management uh, project in place. Now, I suggest that a team should have, every team should have actually a project manager. This shouldn't be the chief engineer or the team leader or whatever, but they should have a person whose responsibility it is to ensure that the time is, that the, the, the time constraints are met, you know, that, that all your deadlines are met. And without wishing to sound sexist or whatever, but quite often such a person, the best person for that job is a woman because women are more uh, detail oriented than guys. Guys will say, oh, I'll be right, we'll catch up tomorrow. But, uh, but women tend to be more fixated on, on, on the actual fact, no, if the design has got to be finished by next Thursday, it's got to be done by next Thursday. Um, if, you know, the first, the rollout is on April the 21st, it's got to happen on April the 21st. So I would suggest to any team that's here listening to me, if you don't already have a project manager, you find one and give them enough power to be able to kick back sides and make things happen. As I said, you need people, easy. You need money, not so easy, but possible. Time, there is no more time available. That's all there is. And that's Pat's words of wisdom for the day. Thank you. You got a question? Sure. Uh, Hello. Change. Hello. Uh, can changing the toy angle uh, of the rear axle uh, help during the turn? Yep. Um, generally, uh, so are you talking about a static toe angle or adjustable toe? Uh, toe angle, uh, changing toe angle. Uh, oh, okay. During the Rear wheel steer. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, I was with the rules committee uh, when we wrote that rule because initially we wanted to ban rear wheel steer because we had some accidents. Um, the engineers at that meeting pointed out to the other people that you cannot ban rear wheel steer because there is always going to be some compliance. So the rules committee came up with a number, six millimeters. Uh, six millimeters of rear steer 
is not really going to give you any advantage that you that that's worthwhile. Um, I would suggest to you that you focus on keeping your rear wheel compliance as little as possible. So you keep your, your steer construction in the back as stiff as possible and set your static rear wheel toe to three millimeters of toe in and work from there. I would never want a situation where the rear wheels were towed out, either statically or in compliance or in kinematics. Okay. Main, main reason for that is that if, if you have a, a tow out situation at the rear, the car will become very unstable and difficult to drive when the driver has the brakes on. Does that help you? Yes, thank you very much. How, however, however, sit down. Yes. Sit down. <laughs> I'm not finished. <laughs> however, the car design is your design, not my design. So if you think that you should have rear wheel steer and you can justify it to the, to the design judges and you can make it work, then you're the winner. My suggestion to you would be, don't worry about it. However, I've been shown to be wrong many, many times. Okay. okay. If I were building a car, would I have rear wheel steer? Nah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Hello. I should be charging uh, money for this. <laughs> yes, we have a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is the way to select the spring stiffness? How do you think you'd select you you'd choose the spring stiffness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you think you'd work it out? Obviously, yeah. obviously, you have to do all the mathematics and calculate your motion ratios. You need to know your, uh, the, the, the weight of your suspended mass and uh, you know, how much, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated uh, mathematical problem that you've got to work out. But, uh, but there is no answer that can give you straight because it all depends on the uh, motion ratio, uh, the, the weight of your car, the un weight of your unsprung mass, and, uh, and what, um, what suspension frequencies that you're looking for. There's no, it's, it's, one of those, it's one of those questions to which there is no easy answer. Sorry. But I can't really tell you any more than that. <laughs> and uh, uh, some more question. Uh, what frame torsional stiffness is uh, one we want to have? Yes or not? Okay. Well, I just I just answered that for the for the other lady earlier. But uh, uh, tell me about are you building you're building a tell me about your chassis space frame or a uh, or space a monocoque or what are you doing? Space frame. Space frame. Okay, look, the rule of thumb is that the chassis torsional stiffness should be one order of magnitude greater than the roll stiffness. What does that mean? Well, without you knowing what your spring rates are going to be, what your roll stiffness is going to be, whether you're going to have anti roll bars or not, who knows? But to give you a number about uh, about 2,000 Newton meters per degree would be a good number to aim for, okay? There's probably no need for you with a Formula student car to be any stiffer than that. Uh, however, the stiffer, the better. Um, the way to determine whether you have sufficient stiffness or not is that if you make a change to, say, the, the uh, 
chassis, uh, suspension stiffness, like spring, spring stiffness, or the anti-roll stiffness, you make a change. If the driver can't feel it, the chassis is not stiff enough. If the driver can feel it, then the chassis is adequately stiff for what you're doing. But about 2,000 newton meters per degree will, will work for you, I promise. Okay. Okay, thank you. Another question? I know. Is it so? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Pat, we have one more question from yeah. the oh. from the guy who was the first asking. Uh, look, you know, I, I am not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm just sitting here at home. So there's no need to wind it up if there are students who still want to ask questions. I'll stay here as long as you want. Okay, thank you. It's got to be a complicated question, I think. <laughs> It's okay. We'll work it out. Maybe I'll give a very complicated answer. No, I don't do that. Keep it simple. Yeah. You know the KISS principle? Which, which one? The KISS principle. Do you know the uh, KISS principle? No, Keep I it don't. simple, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I like the KISS principle. We'll keep it simple. <laughs> but this complicated question. Okay, where you go. Okay, we're ready. Yeah, go. Cool. Before, you, before you start, before you start, the answer is no. <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm just being silly. Uh, what should be anti-squat uh, for more grip uh, on the rear axle uh, and uh, how it uh, will affect uh, during the turn? I talked about anti-squat and anti-dive when we were talking about um, looking after the tires. If, if you put anti-squat geometry into your suspension, you're actually making a binding mechanism which transfers the, which moves the transfer of load from the wheel to the chassis away from the spring and into the suspension arms and forces the tire to become, in essence, the suspension. And honestly, I don't like it very much. If you want to have um, anti-squat in the car, uh, I would recommend that you use a third coil spring and shock absorber, like the examples that I showed you, because any time that you introduce anti-dive or anti-squat into the car, you actually make the car a little bit harder to drive. I would actually be looking at putting geometry into the car that allowed the wheel, both front and rear, to travel backwards slightly in bump. In other words, to reduce or to improve the suspension compliance to make life easier for the tires. Anytime that you put um, uh, anti-dive or anti-squat into the car, you tend to be, uh, you tend to be uh, doing the opposite. You know, making, making the wheel want to move against the force that's being applied. So uh, the, the decision, of course, is yours. The, uh, the design of the car is, is yours. Um, if, you, if, you put, if, if you decide to use anti-squat anti geometry, ensure that you have a full understanding of um, what the permutations and difficulties that you may have because the judges will ask. Um, but, you know, from a personal point of view, I don't particularly like anti-dive or anti-squat. There are better solutions. 
the better solutions being the third uh, coil spring or third spring or damper arrangement uh, at either end of the car. It one one for one for dive and one for squat. Any more question? No, thank you. Yeah. Now, when you get the before you go, um, uh, make sure that uh, that Andre gives you a copy of the notes for the presentation I did today, because I actually talk about anti-dive and anti-squat in that presentation. So you have a read of that, and and that may yeah. Why? Why tell me? Why do you think you need anti-squat? Uh, for more grip uh, on the rear axle. How how is that going to work? The grip grip on the rear axle is uh, increased grip on the rear axle is caused by weight transfer, and the weight transfer occurs whether you have anti squat or not, because uh, all the anti squat does is changes the relationship of the chassis to to the contact patch not not the actual weight transfer you know uh, when you when you uh, accelerate the car inertia causes all forces all forces act through the center of gravity so when you accelerate the car uh, the accelerative force is is uh, is is at, at the tire contact patch of course but the reaction through the center of gravity moves moves weight. There's a weight transfer to the back of the car, and that occurs whether you've got anti-squat or pro-squat or anti-lift or anti-dive geometry or whatever you've got. That occurs. All all you're doing is changing the uh, basically changing the uh, the aspect of the car. Um, in most cases, uh, the uh, anti-squat is introduced into the car to control the rear camber angles, to stop the tires, like the suspension act, you acting and causing the rear tires to sit up on the inside edge because they go into much high negative camber and that then allows wheel spin. Uh, it's, not, uh, you, it's not going to add weight to the rear of the car. That's standard inertia is what just moves moves the weight back regardless of whether you've got anti squat or not have to have uh, some free body drawings required <laughs> okay okay thank you no problem Okay, seems like uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> We've run, run out. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, we're a little bit run out of the time and uh, yeah, seems like no more questions so far. Maybe later I already give uh, to the students your email address. Yeah. So prob probably we'll get the more questions later. Tell, okay. tell them it's ten, $10 per question. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how to, how to make how money big, out of poor... How big will be my, my, my part of the $10? Oh, we better make it $20. Oh, that's good. <laughs> ten, ten for you and ten for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How how do you feel about the election result in the U.S.? Uh, to be honest, I was too busy uh, about the preparation of the seminar, so I don't really follow it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no I, I don't mean the following the, the thing. It's a, have you have you seen um, Claude's responses on email on on uh, Facebook? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's I think he's happy. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That's, that's never cool. mind. <laughs> okay, uh, personally, I don't care. That, that's I don't live in America. <laughs> 
anyway, we'll see what will happen next. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for so, your lectures. It was really useful. Thank you. Good. Good. I said at the beginning that I wasn't going to get involved in uh, in you know heavy mathematics or whatever. I was going to try keep it practical, and I think that that worked out. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good fun. You know that. Um, so when are we going to do the next one? <laughs> I don't know. At this Whenever. moment, I think we should stop because we have uh, next lectures uh, coming in twenty minutes. Yeah. So this okay. is some some short break. Yeah. And, yeah. I think okay. That's it. Well, okay. I would just like to say to the students, thanks for their attention. Thanks for their questions. Um, I look forward to maybe, hopefully, seeing them all as former student Russia next year. Um, hopefully. We'll have an answer to the COVID uh, virus by then, and uh, you know, feel free to uh, to email me questions. I'm not going to tell them how to make their car. I'm not going to give them the, the answers, but I'll tell them where to look or how to find it. It's uh, yeah, okay. Thanks again, Andre, for uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk to them. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>